What's up, those voice fans? Hey, those voice guys. Uh, we really appreciate it if you went ahead and subscribed. Um, take your finger. Take your finger. Push that button. Wherever that button is on the screen, you're not going to hit the screen. You're going to hit the button that's somewhere by our name. Mm-hmm. Hit the subscribe button. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you for doing that and liking this video. Um, stick around for the end of the podcast for a surprise. Big surprise. Big, big surprise at the end of our podcast. Huge surprise. Um, every episode, there's a big surprise. Mm-hmm. But this one's going to be the biggest one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't even know, man. Yeah, I know. Um, maybe they do know. <laughs> How much, dude? Remember what we told you, though, about the rabbit? The rabbit move? I know. Yes. Nice. That gets you going. It does. I'm a rabbit. Let's move on. Yes. Um, all jokes aside, here on episode 15, um, it's time that we sort of get a little bit more um, aware and educated on the definitions around religious trauma and specifically religious trauma syndrome. I am extremely uneducated in the therapy or psycho psychology and psychoanalytics research that is out there on religious trauma and uh, fundamental trauma, like things from fundamental religious and different types of cults and upbringings. Of course, there's an insane amount of research on a lot of these topics. And one of the things I found fascinating about religious trauma is when I think about research and therapy about people that grow up in religion and have these experiences and have personality dysfunctional disorders and behavioral issues, anorexia and suicidal ideation and you name it and difficult to keeping marriages together. Um, it's hard. It's like when I've been thinking like, is there any research out there? I just immediately assume probably not much. What do you think? Do you think there's a lot of research out there on this topic? On religious trauma? On a religious trauma syndrome. I think I think in the last handful of years, yeah, I think recently a lot more research has come out. As in, what do you think recently, just personally? Um, I think it's every year. Every year on year is probably getting more research. I don't know yeah. about the research that they would be looking into specifically. Um, every religion is so different, so it's probably different for every religion. And every branch of religion too, it just gets complicated. Maybe, yeah. I think that's like a that's a state. I think it's like I have a lot of questions, right? It's like so. There's like opinions, and then I have like a lot of questions around what the hell is religious trauma syndrome. You and I are what we consider. We talked about this experts in our experiences, right? So, mm-hmm. like when it comes to California Calvary Chapel, we are experts in the experience of being pastors' kids in Northern California, mm. right? And affiliated with Calvary Chapel. Yeah. Which is a very specific sect of non-denominational Christianity. Yeah. Right. Everything else, we have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Like that's just, that's just it. I have a lot of questions. I don't want to even speak for you. And so when I think about like asking you that, it's more of, that's what I've been asking myself. Like what's out there. I thought the same thing. Probably not much. If there is any research out there, it's got to be recent because I've never heard anything about RTS, which Mm -hmm. is religious trauma syndrome. Well, that's new. RTS is recent. That's a name, right? So we're like defining things. The moment I even heard that religious trauma syndrome was a thing, I felt safer, Mm -hmm. right? Like, even though I feel like I've dealt with a lot of my real intense trauma, like in the last few years, knowing that there's a definition of RTS, like the acronym made me feel a little bit less, oh, it's just like anything else. Mm. Depression, anxiety, RTS, like all these, like it's just another one of those were humans you know everyone's humans now there's like a definition to it and so i just find it fascinating that like there when i opened up online i just decided we're going to go to the wikipedia Mm. and we're going to search religious trauma syndrome and of course i was blown away with um how much research is out there how many books are out there and how long it's been out there wow and so reading this i think that some of the ways they talk about this concept of religious trauma syndrome is like we're we're like when people find out, like when people know that it's, there's an actual psychology behind it and there's research behind it, people that are dealing with RTS severely immediately just knowing there's science behind it start to heal. Mm. 
right? It's just like immediately because you don't think that there's much like, oh, I don't think there's anything out there really for me. And it's like, actually, there's so much research out here for you mm. and therapy and people that care. And you're like, oh, really? <laughs> you know, it's like because it's like, what the fuck? There's, there's all this shit going on my whole life. And I didn't even know that people have been researching about it. Like, why didn't I know? Well, there's also just a lot of people on this planet, man. There's research being done in every aspect of most but, things. It's just, it's tough to find it for one. Sure. And two, it doesn't, until it's popular, you're not going to find it. A lot, a lot of scholars are researching things all the time. And unless you're searching for it, you're not finding it. And right. uh, I wasn't told, I was told five years ago, I think when I first heard about religious trauma syndrome or getting religious trauma therapy from a religious trauma therapist. Really? Who was, the, oh, so you had, you actually had a therapist that was a religious. No, no, no. I've never gone that route. I thought about it. Really? Um, of, of looking into that, but that was earlier. Now, right. now I think I'm dealing with it a different way. But um, I remember being told that and being surprised. And like, oh, wow, that's cool that we've come up with a branch for mm. that now. But so, it's yeah. new. It's it's newer, like, to psychology. And you were somebody that had started their own personal journey on mental health, which started with a Christian therapist, right? It did. And so the idea of having, like, psychology around religious trauma, did you, was that even brought up with a Christian therapist? No. No, you use God to heal your therapy. Woof. Yep. What the woof. That's crazy. Yeah. But I mean, I asked him not to. So like when I went into- Is like, that possible mm -hmm. with a Christian therapist? I mean, I their biases, everyone has a bias, um, but I did say I didn't want to do I think that route. bias is, I don't think everyone, I think there are a lot of people that are a lot less biased than certain people. Can I ask you a question? Was your therapist a white male? Yes. Okay. White males are pretty biased, which is me saying it was a pretty biased thing I mean, to say. Long story coming short. Coming from a white male. <laughs> long story short, the therapy didn't work out. And long. I got a different therapist right, got you. years later, okay. many years later. But um, he was my first there. They were my first therapist. And uh, yeah, they weren't going to work out from the start. I just was in crisis Did you and know didn't that? know what to do. Um, I knew he wasn't doing what I needed mm. from the get-go. How old were you? 19. So 19 is when you had your first therapist. And then you said you discovered like, like religious trauma syndrome. 26. 26. So 25, 26. Years after. Mm-hmm. So not from a therapist. Really? So in my therapy, even with my good therapist yeah. that I had for like four years at the time, uh, yeah, we didn't, we never talked about religion. Yeah. So here's the thing is, and I am extremely like in love with my therapist. <laughs> like I love my therapist and I don't ever plan on like, we have such a great relationship and he's never brought up religious trauma syndrome. And I wonder if that's because of my amazing job at suppressing the trauma that comes from the church and religion for sure, and focusing more on just depression and anxiety and anger and which are probably like everyone deals with their own things from their own experiences, but specifically to you and me, what we're talking about in this cast is directly related to the religious trauma of our childhood. Yeah. And so I think I've done a good job at, at not being honest with myself about you know, pin, pinpointing really why and how, and, uh, you know, when we, not too long ago, when we started this, you know, had a cast that was like really bringing out some trauma of our childhood and someone in our family texted the both of us a pretty direct attacking text mm -hmm. of get over it, move on. Why are you doing this? Come on, grow up. And it was like you and I both called each, I called you right away. And it was just like, yeah, that's why we're doing this, mm -hmm. you know, is because, we have moved on. We're just having the this conference. is us moving on. This is on. exactly. This is actually the most powerful we've ever been. That's why we're like doing it. And religious trauma is just like the big part of what we're talking about. And we know very little about it, but have had a lot of mental health therapy in our own journeys. Dude, in reality, it's interesting. In reality, I look at it as um, I've never been able to pinpoint why I feel certain ways until I've attached it to religious trauma. And I've always been trying to figure out why I have certain issues with certain things, think certain ways, 
And it always really stems from where it starts is some of my religious trauma. Mm. Cool. That, that even like I've approached in therapy for years and years and years with just what I've brought it up as. But if I think if I approached it more from, I learned this through my religious trauma, is that what's making this happen? I think that would correlate a lot more. Yeah. Just being honest that that's, it can be a lot of things. It doesn't have to just be one thing. No, 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 for sure. Right? But like, I don't think, I don't think I've had the, the strength to identify it as much as I do now. Or maybe the, even the language. Yeah. The definitions, yeah. the awareness. I think that's what I'm trying to get at for the both of us is how it looks. Um, for me, I didn't, like, I haven't re- learned about religious trauma syndrome until you and I decided to do a cast about <laughs> religious trauma syndrome. Yeah. But I have read a lot about different types of traumas and i am been on a, a mental health journey since I freaking moved out. Yeah. I remember my first shroom trip was like very quickly after I got out of mom and dad's mm-hmm. and talk about a uh, religious experience and mental health like nah, you are one. yeah, dude. What was what was it like taking shrooms at a young age? Um, because it developed or acid or anything. Yeah, a, or develop, like, a developing mind is much different. Oh, you're telling me, man. So now I feel like I'm like, oh my, are you sure? You, are you sure you guys want to do this today? <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, I'll take a little. It's like I'm so much more nervous now because it's so sensitive, and I almost feel like because of the explorative personality I had at a young age, which was amazing and fun and scary as fuck at times and yeah. learned my lesson a handful of times was like, it's almost like my memory is there. So when I, my brain touches psilocybin or gets LSD, it's like 10 minutes later, it's like, Whoa, is everybody else <laughs> feeling it? And the, everyone's like, Whoa, uh, no, it's been 10 minutes. Right. It's been 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm just like really sensitive to it now because I was doing it then or you just aren't as sensitive to it and the developing mind. Yeah. And then you become way more. Maybe it's not even sensitivity. Maybe it's conceptualizing it. Yeah. Perspective. Because I feel like hallucinogenics are a lot more perspective based. And if you don't have the proper perspective um, of maturity on existence and things, I think you can't fully understand what's actually happening. Well, I um, was, I had a lot of anxiety. I was scared, but like I literally, I, I was able to reason at a young age that in order to have experience that's fun and exciting, it might be a little scary because one of the things I was taught was, Hey, if you do, if you have that, if you do shrooms or if you try acid or if you have sex, it's you know before marriage or whatever, this is sin. And the reason why you're doing it is because it feels good. Sin mm-hmm. feels really good. And so what feels good, probably like what I, what, what feels I, good probably is bad. It's bad. So what I learned from that, even if like somebody was here now being like, that's not what the Bible says. It's like what I received as a kid was what feels good is probably bad. So when I like walked away from the church and God, I was like, Oh, what feels bad is fine. Mm. So I should probably do that. And that, and like, so I had that feeling that guiltiness. That's really deep. That led me down a lot of path of making some wildly crazy fun decisions that were really risky, Mm. but like taught me so much. And then it also led me down some pretty dangerous decisions that found me in places where I was like, Oh, I got to get out of here. I've learned. This was my choice. Mm. This was bad, you know? So, um, yeah. And so as a young age, I was kind of like, you know, like the people I was doing with who were like, what felt like family is like, I was in a great setting with somebody that was like a little older than me, who was like my shaman, best friend, so well educated. He read all the books and, you know, I'm not the greatest reader. So I just benefited from just, Mm. we would get super stoned and he would just tell me, so here's the thing about DMT, man. And I'd just be like, huh get it mm-hmm. let's try it mm-hmm. here's the thing about acid bro nah. and then he with lsd i was so scared to try psychedelics that i told i told him i was like please give me a book or something so he gave me a book and it was timothy leary's tune in drop night turn on tune in whatever drop out mm. and i read that book and i didn't even read the whole thing i think i had like three quarters most of it and Timothy Leary is a wild, that uh, history is wild mm. of like the LSD movement and the government and everything else. But um, that's what gave me like that knowledge of just at the time, like learning a lot about the history of LSD and the government and just how corrupt 
everything is was enough for me to be like the government of this country and the government of my family is fucked up, man. Mm. That's why I got to try this because it was like, why wouldn't I try the thing that they're like, it's it's so not bad. Like, yeah, that's there. I'm so scared, but like, I don't believe I can't, I can't live by my parents' rules and Mm. I can't think that what they're saying is true because it just doesn't feel right because I'm really learning and I have great friends. And so here we go. So it was literally like, <laughs> okay, dude, here we go. Like, yeah. Fucking nuts. It was so scary. And then it was well, and also, all very real. I mean, hallucinogenics at a young age, I mean, hallucinogenics are scary in general. Yeah. But hallucinogenics at a young age are terrifying. Yeah. I had friends that didn't grow up religious at all that I went to high school with that were, te- everyone was so terrified yeah. to do hallucinogenics. I didn't at a young age. I still, I mean, everyone, it's still scary. Yeah. It's a scary thing. Um, and I still have never done LSD, so I don't, I don't know. Why it's scary. Anyways. Yeah. I think like <laughs> as a kid, I uh, can go, I can remember what, here's what's amazing is, is from my experience in growing up in the church and what we've talked about the last, like the cast, we talked about the afterglows, which are the worship sessions, late worship sessions at uh, church camps and youth groups that go for two hours. Mm. Um, you know, those spiritual experiences that you would have. And we talked about is like when I finally had, my first psychedelic trip, we went ha- hiking at Mount Tamalpais mm. in, uh, uh, and, uh, which is like a very spiritual mountain has mm. a lot of history and, uh, manzanita trees that just have those bare bark branches. And, uh, I'll never forget at a young age, some of those experiences, but I was so ready. I was so supercharged spiritually for to see shit, you know, like God's voice, the spiritual realm, and we did shrooms and went hiking on Mount Tam. And it was like, it's real. <laughs> I hear God's voice. I didn't know it was there. You know, it was like, that's, that is, do you want to, you want to hear God's voice and see the spiritual realm? Do shrooms. Yeah. Like you actually will have an experience where, you know, like it's whatever, not saying that that's what it is, but it was pretty wild. And then all of the times I've had it with different people and different things, what I've learned is. I just didn't feel safe doing it again until I was with the love of my life. And now here I am doing it with, you know, the love of my life and my family. Mm -hmm. And so I feel really lucky because I feel the safest with the people I'm doing it with. And that's what matters is if I don't feel safe, it's going to be an unsafe feeling most Mm -hmm. of the time. And, um, and I think my religious trauma has been like, there's been a lot of healing with my choices to take huge risks and taking psychedelics and going on eight hour hikes and and feeling the world and getting grounded in ways that like help me really feel my body mm-hmm. in ways that like I feel very lucky to have friends that got this stuff and pushed me to try it because it helped me really feel less freaking suicidal as at a young age. Yeah. After my first relationship and she bailed brutal and cheated on me, I was smoking cigarettes and took an, dark mad and we went and did shrooms and i softened up so fast man it was yeah. wild it was so cool mm. but i was still so scared and so it took me a long time to learn that that medicine was profitable you know, like really helpful rather than being this scary thing that's like so scary all the time well it's not just you it's taking a long time it's the entire fucking world is taking a long time too yeah well i mean our country specifically I think there's a lot of countries that other haven't countries, taken one Other time. countries are even stricter. Istanbul, right? Isn't that like Amsterdam? Amsterdam's just one small country, dude. I want to. That's where everyone's always gone, no, right? No, for sure. But you can do anything you want in Amsterdam. Colorado just legalized shrooms. One state. We got complete we got legalization for sure. For sure, it doesn't change the fact that it's like we have 49 other states, and some of them are even trying to ban abortion still. So we really got to get some shit in order, yeah. dude. But uh, why don't we? Move down the wiki. Yeah. Train do, you, here. do you have a uh, clock? What time do we actually yeah. start? We got, we're at 33 right now. Um, yeah. We're going to, d- right now, we're going to dive in to the Wikipedia of religious trauma syndrome. And so if you're listening to the cast, this is the Wikipedia. You could Google this, read this, the same exact thing, click the links, like how that's how I, know, how I learn things is I go on Wikipedia and I read the Wikipedia and I can find a lot of amazing books through there and what have you. Um, so this is, we're learning and if you're listening, learn with us. And when, after we go through some of this, we're going to read some paragraphs, talk about it together 
And then we're probably going to take a little break, play a game of war. And we'll come back and we'll finish the Wikipedia page. And we'll just go through this page today. Go Sounds good? It. Let's go. Religious drama is recognized in psychology and psychotherapy as a set of symptoms ranging in severity experienced by those who have participated in or left behind authoritarian, dogmatic, and controlling religious groups and belief symptoms. Systems, excuse me. Symptoms include cognitive, affective, functional, and social cultural issues, as well as developmental delays. So it's saying there, ranging in severity as in a set of symptoms experienced by those who have participated in or left behind authoritarian, dogmatic, and controlling religious groups and belief systems. So the only thing that's saying actually like belief and spirituality is religious groups and belief systems. Some would say that religious groups and belief systems are authoritarian and dogmatic. Mm -hmm. Of course they are. Those are all the same. Would you agree? I would. Yeah. Do we know the definition of dogmatic? And it's totally okay if we don't. I I I, 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 I can off the top of my head. No. I could like I know what it, in context. I could bullshit it on, but let's just click dogmatic. I feel like when I hear it in a sentence, I'm like, I get you, yeah. but I don't really know the definition. Dogmatic is a belief or set of beliefs that is accepted by the members of a group without being questioned or doubted. It may be in the form of an official system of principles or doctrines of a religion, such as Roman Catholicism, Judaism, or Pro Protestantism, Pro Protestant, as well as the positions, blah, blah, blah. So it's a belief or set of beliefs that is accepted by the members of a group without being questioned or doubted, mm -hmm. right? Believing, like, believing with faith without believing. Yeah, yeah my, faith, my way with, or the highway. Yeah, right. So that's like so Christianity, at least the way we were raised, was extremely dogmatic. My way or the highway. Don't question it, bro. It's faith. Mm. Authoritarian is a political system characterized by the rejection of political plural, plur, plurality. Sorry, I am my speech impediment. Plurality. I have, plurality. I have a speech impediment, brother. The use of strong central power to preserve the political status quo and reductions in the rule of law, separation of powers, democratic voting, right? That's authoritarianism. That's uh, dictatorship, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, all right. Symptoms include cognitive, meaning your uh, in the perception of contradictory information, the mental toll of it, relevant items of information, including a person's actions, feelings, ideas, beliefs, or cognitive. Affective is an occurrence of sensation accompanied with a strong compulsion to act on it. Uh, it refers mostly in neuroscience to the emotional sensibility in, responsive, in response to effective stimuli of a particular valence, functional, social, cultural, and developmental delays. Sorry, I know it's confusing if I read all the definitions. But ultimately, religious drama syndrome are all those symptoms which basically sounds like it just covers all the bases yeah <laughs> right top to bottom you fucked cool probably yeah. religious trauma <laughs> that got you there you have a depression anxiety you have problems with your marriage you have problems with your family you have problems with keeping a job you have problems with eating you have problems with uh, addiction you have problems with well just similarly to the same way as if your dad beat your mom and he was a drunk your entire life that's going to cause you some trauma. It's like if you are forced to believe this thing for your entire life until a certain age, you're going to have some trauma. So right. I, I, that's the way I take religious trauma is it's like you were in one reality until what age? What age did you change your reality? It's like mm -hmm. you choose to not be in this reality anymore that was given to you since birth, nothing else you knew. And now you have to figure out your world without anyone teaching you your world because your reality was already given to you and you're denying it now. Interesting. And moving on. What's interesting that you just said that is I'm pretty sure when I was looking at this early, over earlier, we're going to get to how that is exactly correct. That when somebody gets, when they remove themselves from that group and then they're like all on their own, that's when... The trauma oh, sets in sure. and all of these symptoms. And then they go see a therapist and the therapist is like, this is, and you start talking about all it, your trauma down. goes away when you just believe it and go back to it. Right. It all goes away. Cause you're just going to keep doing it to come back, which is, uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> so moving on, you want to move on? Yes. RTS. I like that religious trauma syndrome or RTS, the acronyms. we got to love acronyms as a nurse. That's, ugh. RTS occurs in response to twofold trauma. 
So two, two, two different areas of drama. First, the prolonged abuse of indoctrination from a controlling religious community. And secondly, the act of leaving the controlling religious community, which is what you just said. Mm-hmm. So first bit of trauma is being indoctrinated. Second bit of trauma is being is you leaving the indoctrination. Mm-hmm. Brutal. Mm. So it's like, hey, join the group, leave the group. Both are going to fuck you up. Yeah. Joining me. It's like joining a gang and leaving a gang. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind it's of very, very much is or joining a cult, cult. leaving a cult. I mean, it's not a, a gang is a little bit different, right? Of course. But a cult is much more culty. A little mm-hmm. bit culty. Um, looking at it that way. RTS has developed as its own heuristic collection. I don't know what heuristic means. Heuristic is the process by which humans use mental shortcuts to arrive at decisions. Mental shortcuts to arrive at decisions. Heuristic. Heuristic. Interesting. Mental, I like that. Mental shortcuts to arrive at decisions. It's like I do that. I think a lot of privileged people do that. <laughs> yeah. They're like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. If people are poor, it's because they're not working. Yeah, they're not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot, a lot of sad. shortcuts. So many shortcuts. Oh my God. I feel like RTS has developed as its own um, collection of mental shortcuts of symptoms informed by psychological theories of trauma originating in PTSD, CPTSD, and betrayal trauma theory taking relational and social context into account when approaching further research and treatment. Mm. Um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a mental and behavioral disorder that can develop because of exposure to, to a traumatic events such as sexual assault, warfare, traffic collisions, child abuse, domestic violence, or other threats in a person's life. Just reading the definitions of some of these things and knowing that it's like a tiny little acronym in the RTS is something that I think is really important to do mm-hmm. because it just makes it heavy because mm-hmm. it's like makes it tangible and real. Do you know what CPTSD is? CPTSD? Yeah. Um, Complex post-traumatic stress disorder is a psychological disorder that is theorized to develop in response to exposure to a series of traumatic events and a context in which the individual perceives little or no chance of escape and particularly where the exposure is prolonged or repetitive. Huh. Sounds a lot like RTS. Sounds a lot like RTS. Yeah. It's like, which is PTSD, CPTSD and betrayal trauma theory. Betrayal trauma is defined as a trauma perpetrated by someone with whom the victim is close to and reliant upon for support and survival. (laughs) getting a little dark dude <laughs> it's not even getting dark it's getting real it's getting real it's getting tangible because it's that makes a lot of sense yeah um so let's just i'm gonna now that we kind of read through those definitions rts has developed as its own heuristic collection of symptoms meaning mental shortcuts informed by psychological theories of trauma originating from ptsd cpsd and betrayal trauma theory taking relational and social context into account when approaching further research and treatment Mm. I like that definition for heurist. Heuristic. Heuristic. Yeah. yeah. That's I'm gonna I'm gonna try to remember that and keep using that. Yeah. I are and, and stop doing it. Well, no, just be like, <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm I'm trying to avoid being heuristic, but like I want to like start incorporating that in my it's, it's dialogue. Like, oh, it's almost like if you're like everybody's always like this way, and if someone's like, how do you know that you don't know everybody? You're like, sorry, I, I tend to be a little heuristic. Mm. And I need to get, you know, it's like, that's what that is, right? Yeah. When we jump to like conclusions that when we say things like, why is it that everybody thinks this way? Yeah. That's a mental shortcut to make this way generalized assumption of like mm-hmm. something we don't know anything about. You know, it's like opinions and questions. Mm. Heuristic or simple strategies that humans and animals, organizations, and even machines use to quickly form judgments, make decisions, and find solutions to complex problems. It's like uh, climate change. Well, it's almost like if A plus B equals C one time, then A plus B equals C all the time. Yeah. That's you're taking too many shortcuts. There's too many other things that could interfere. Therefore, A plus B does not always equal C. Or if it was like A, A plus B equals F and the person was like... That doesn't make any sense. And you're like, yeah, it does because A plus B equals C. It's like, that doesn't yeah, make sense. that's yeah. like a heuristic way of assuming just because A plus B equals C, that means A plus B equals F. True. I think it's also a really dumb way to try to understand this new word, but yep. 
it's a good approach for us to, you know, we're being vulnerable here, right? And, you know, we don't know a lot of these definitions. Um, I'm going to finish this last paragraph and then we'll take a little break and get after the game. Sounds good. The term religious trauma syndrome was coined. Here we go. What's the year? What's your guess? When was this religious trauma syndrome? I'm going to say 1972. Holy shit. It was coined in 2011. Holy fuck. That's young. So, but let me keep going. Back. I went so early because I was like, I'm, I'm going to be way off. Let me, let me, let me keep going. So it was coined in 2011 by psychologist Marlene Winnell in an article for British Association for Behavioral and Cognit- Cognitive Psychotherapies. Through the phenomenon was recognized long, though the phenomenon was recognized long before that. Mm. So defining things and getting them into 2011? journals. 2011? 2011 was when it was so defined in a I journal. when I graduated high school, it was finally defined in science. In a, in a scientific journal. That's what I'm talking about. That's why it's like, yeah, this is not talked about enough yet. When, and Megan, uh, my partner, she has, you know, two, almost three peer-reviewed articles now that she's written, which mm-hmm. is our research. And that's like scientific. And this was med- the first. This is like, yeah, it's like defining it. Oh, that's Even so Even though the phenomenon was recognized long before that, it wasn't actually whatever. Yeah. The term is circulated among psychotherapists former fundamentalists and other recovering from religious indoctrination, of course, because people have been going through this for centuries. Winnell explains the need for a label and the benefits of naming the symptoms encompassed by RTS as similar to naming anorexia as a disorder. Mm. The label can lessen shame and isolation for survivors while promoting diagnosis, treatment, and training for professionals who work with those suffering from the condition. Survivors report relief when they find out that RTS is real. Mm. Damn. I found relief when I when I found out about it. I found lots of relief doing this cast with you and coming to this conclusion and then searching it. Mm. Even, even with, yeah, I just think that it's like mind boggling to me. And I think it, it's something, I think you're right. It's something to be said that it's like wild that somebody took the time and energy after having all these conversations and hearing about it and hearing about it, and there was somebody like, what did Marlene Winnell go through to go through all of school and all of academia to get to the point of wanting to do research and write it a whole piece and article on. She probably suffers from RTS. Maybe. I mean, that's an assumption. That's or speculation. She knows someone she has to have gotten pushed in that direction somehow. Yeah. It's probably just didn't stumble upon it. It probably was, Inter- but we also don't know. We, we don't learn. know. But I think it would be amazing if someday we could freaking interview Marlene Winnell. Oh, that'd be dope. That would be Definitely amazing. Definitely make note of that. That'd be an amazing interview. Well, I think that's why we're doing this now is because I want us to like have recorded content True. that we have posted that we're saying the names and the dates because we're educating ourselves. Yeah. And I think that we're going to keep coming back to this Wikipedia and we're always going to have it. Marlene what? Marlene Winnell. 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 Yeah. And, uh, and her whole, and I think that's like, yeah, we're, what makes Marlene Winnell and this Pete, like her defining it so important is what she's saying here. That Winnell explains the need for a label and the benefits of naming the symptoms encompassed by RTS. I think that when we label things, it gives people an ability to define their trauma. Mm-hmm. Without labels, there is no trauma. Or solution. Or solution. Well, there's no trauma to begin with. Or help. There's just nothing. Yeah. There's nothingness when there's nothing to say. When you you don't have language for it, you can't speak on it. Mm -hmm. You can't have a voice on it. Then you're just a crazy person. Yeah. Thanks, Marlene Winnell, for doing the work of defining RTS in 2011. Um, I I think you're going to go on to help a lot of people. I was thinking she probably has. I think that the, as we keep reading, we're gonna you're gonna be shocked. Marlene Winnell is just the one. There's so many people on just this Wikipedia man, and like so many topics. It's gonna take us a really long time to get through this Good. page, and we're gonna learn a lot. Good. Um, if you're still with us, we're gonna go over and start playing our game cam game, which cam. today we are playing war, playing the card game war. You ready, baby? Do you want to remind me real quick how to play War? So basically, we both have half a deck of cards here. You have your deck here. You're going to take a card. You're going to flip it over. Whoever has the highest card steals your card and theirs back, and then you put it on your deck. 
goal is to get all the cards in the deck. Mm. If we both put down the same card, we go to war. Oh, what's war? War is you move, you take one card, you put it face down, and then you take another card, you put it face up. Whoever wins that war gets all the cards. If we match again, we do the same thing over and over until someone wins. And you take all the cards if we win. Yep. I mean, the ones that are flipped over. Yep. <sighs> You're gone. I lose a lot on this cast. <laughs> you did beat us uh, last night in trouble, though. We played a game of yeah, trouble well, with the ladies and yeah, Nate with our partners. Booties. Well, that was a tough game, man. Tough that was game. like one piece. We were coming back to base, and it's then like all a of a two-hour trouble game. And then I then I put on I put on skill, and I started calling no, my rolls. I started calling my rolls. Me. Ready? And one, two, three. Daddy wins. One, two, three. Um, Poppy wins. Poppy. Now, if you're daddy, I have to be, um, we'll figure it out. One, two, three. Take it. I don't even want the nine. One, two, three. Yeah. God, dude, we didn't even shuffle. Did you shuffle? I shuffled like crazy. Yeah. I feel like we need to be shuffling on camera from now on <laughs> so that me and the folks can see at home that you're actually not a cheat. Give me that. One, two, three. Yeah. Am I shaking things? No, you're good. Give me that. One, two, three. Nice ace. Give me that. Oh, you can see. <laughs> you can see my cards. <laughs> one, two, three. Ooh, Ooh, we're going to war, baby. Get ready for war here right. live so on don't, the don't, game don't cam. Don't look at the upside down card. One. Put it down and then flip. Oh! <laughs> we're going to war, baby. Oh, wait, hold, wait, hold, wait, wait. So you flip one. We do one down. You flip another one over. Now what? We do one down. Flip another one over. Okay, one, get that, and then one, two. Go on top of it. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Oh! Ah! Beat you by a point. See, this is like, I, I think you get lucky on the cast. Honestly, <laughs> like, that's crazy. You beat me by one card with speed the last week. I know. And then you beat me by one point Dude, there. it's just older brother syndrome. You're just getting older. Older brother <laughs> OBS. <laughs> it's OBS. I got that OBS, man. You got Ready? that YBS. Yep. Ready? One, two, three. You're supposed to be putting your cards at the bottom of your deck, by the way. Why? Because you have to. You're gonna be going through them again. Those are your cards how, now. How do you win? You lose. You lose all your cards. I gain all your cards. That's how I win. That's how you. Is that really the way you win, though? Yeah. You, you Once know. you're out of cards. One, two, three. Which is gonna be. Sh very I thought shortly. it was like. Uh, I thought it was. Oh, forget it. One, two, three. This is this. Okay. More. There we go. Down. You're going down. Go. Oh, nice. Give me those. Finally, see? We know you're in the lead. I know you're in the lead. No, war can flip pretty quick, baby. Two, three. Two, three. Oh, beat me by a point. One, beat two, me by three. Point. One, two, three. I think there's a lot of skill in this game, by the way. <laughs> I do. Yeah? Yeah, the way you throw them down, I think it like changes depending on how you... Like, yeah. That was a really... That finesse. Yeah. Do that again. Like the finesse. Ah, oh, you had better finesse. If you can't get the card from not bouncing. Ooh, you see? Mine didn't bounce. Oh, yours is... Well, maybe it's a little bit of a similar bounce. Take him. I don't want him. The iPod photo is down. Repeat, the iPod photo is down. This game is getting intense, folks. One, two, three. Yeah. War. War. Yeah. Oof. Ah! Oof. So if this is really like, if we really play till all the cards are gone, this might take... No, it's not going to take one. How does it happen? Do you just keep playing? It's maybe been a long time since I've no, played. No, it's been like four minutes we've been playing. No, I'm just saying like... In the, this game of war, uh, it yeah. feels like this could go on forever. Like the game goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, I need to have better skill. Oof, it is going back and forth at the moment. Oof. 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 <laughs> ah! Damn it, dude. <laughs> No. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you gotta make wipe it with your nasty fingers like this. You have to make sounds. <laughs> Down. You're going down, come Mr. On, come on, Mr. Come on. Nathaniel. Put, Put the cart down. Mine. You do have a lot of aces over there, big guy. Grow up. They're going down. One, two, three. I see you just looking right into my cards, dude. Oh, final looking dear. Five. And a two. Damn. <laughs> Alright, let's shuffle our cards. Really? Well, I think we're just getting in the same flow. I think we gotta put some put some fate. (laughs) I could throw some fate into there because it's like (laughs) if we really kept going back and forth, it's just gonna keep going back and forth. Well, that's what I'm saying. Maybe it does go back and forth forever. Isn't there a way to win? Yeah, you keep playing. One, two, three. Shuffling just got us right and bloody. Mm-hmm. Don't you remember when you put three down, three cards down? Nope. This is the three. One, two, three. Ready? Go. Yes. Take them. This is stupid. Yes. That was really dumb. Yeah. Who's that, Tom? It was a little dumb. Oh, that's dumb. Oh, that's I like how we play these games where I, I guarantee you this is going to be another draw. Oh, well, we can't finish the game in time. How about this? Whoever loses their cards first wins. No. Let's go. I was trying to think out loud. Like, yeah. there's got to be a way where we can play the game one time through. Whoever has the most cards wins. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's go again. I, I let, yep. Thank you for that. Let's go one more time. You think I have an ace? You think I have an ace? I really hope you have an ace. I don't. I, you know what? I'm going to say it out loud. I think that the way this could work would be like you play all the way through it until all of your cards are gone one, one time through and then whoever has the most amount of cards in their pile wins. Okay, come on. Want to do that this time? No. Oh my God, dude. This is gonna, it's never going to end. You know it's never going to end. I know it's never gonna. This is gonna be another. This this game is war. Just doing it, dude. I'm in the lead, so it's gotta end. Let's go. I know you're in the lead, but if you win, it's like, it, it's like, what? You just don't want me to win. You always win. <laughs> so it's like Oof. I don't want. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> you do have these aces though that are keeping you alive. Not for long. Looks like you're low on cards there, Nate. Oof. Oof. Oh, you thought I was going to get a two? Oh, man. It's going quick now, folks. Ready? And go. Caught it. Oh my gosh, this is a small file. And I'm mixing them up too, like as I'm picking them up. Oh, it's never, it's always gonna be a little random, I think, man. It's okay. I do have aces in here. I know. These aces are gonna just take, I know. it's gonna never end. We'll see. Yeah. Or you have an ace. I have aces. You, you, need, you need that ace to hit my ace. I know. <laughs> That's really what we're probably gonna have to wait for. Oh my gosh. Oh, Ooh, we are going to war. And the elephant wants to be in this one. Yeah, let the elephant judge. Dun, da, da, da. Flip. Oh, six beats a three. Sorry, Dad. It's okay, son. What if I got some of your aces there? Oh, uh, one go. ace. He would have gotten one. Yeah. Oh, I guess not. Clearly <laughs> not. <laughs> I took my four. You got my four. 
Oh, I got king and an aces. Shit. Shit. Oh no! Folks, Zach's coming out. I think that this game's rigged. I think I think the cast is rigged. <laughs> you got your aces back to back, which is tough. I think this game's rigged, man. I think the cast is something in the table. It's against me. I don't want to play the victim though. <laughs> you kind of are. But I just feel like I'm losing so many times and like in real life we know who's winning. <laughs> You're gonna take my ace. Let's go. Let's go. I didn't think there'd be an end of this game. Ace, ace, ace. Seven. Three! Yeah. I didn't I did not I can't lose those. Your your ace was like like at the bottom. Though. No, I know. I just you gotta beat you. <laughs> mm. Oh. Come on now, come on now, come on now. You can have my two. Ace. Ace. You got those aces. Man. Jack and five. Ace. <sighs> Come on, land an ace on an ace. Oof, going to war, baby. Fuck yes. Mm -hmm. Weren't your aces, though. You already used your aces. Mm hmm. Fuck, dude. All right, so I have a lot of low cards in here mm -hmm. and a bunch of like five or six high cards that I don't know how you're going to get these aces. I don't know how many of them either. Not like that. Oof. You needed that to be. I know. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Fuck. If you're uh, only listening, I know that this is part of the cast or you should probably skip it. But if you're not, if you're only listening... Watch the fucking cast. <laughs> Look at the game cam, folks. The great music, too, in the background. I'm sharing new songs under Nene and Neo Man. Maybe songs that you'll use for your album. Who knows? Mm. Oh, fuck. Okay. Now let's do oh! your thing. Oh! <laughs> Oh, look at that, folks. Because, no, it's ne it is never going to end. <laughs> look at that, folks. Zach's starting to, to understand what I was saying. Look, I got your ace, too. I got an ace in there. <laughs> Fuck me. So, uh, the way you want to do this is, if I run out of cards right now, we're going to say you win because I only have them. I mean... Count how many cards you have. Everything? Yeah, yeah, put those back in your deck. Count how many cards you have. Real quick before I count them. The winner. So I'm ahead by two. The winner of the war takes both pairs of played cards and the three cards face down, winning five of their opponents. If the both cards are face down, then you go to front. The player who wins all of the cards wins the game. Yeah, it takes forever. Oh my god, that would take so, so long. I'm ahead of you by two cards right now. How do you know? Because there's only 56 cards in a deck. That means there's 28 cards in between us, and I have 30. So then, do we go through this last deck, and we don't put them in our card deck, and whoever has the most left over in their pile wins? Yes. Good luck. Let's go. It's even now. No, it's not. Yeah, because you were two above me. That means you have one above me, and I have one now. And you only gained one. Yeah, and you and lost one. I have 29, one. and you have 27. But I gained... So you got to gain one more. Give it to me. Fine, now we're tied. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the lead. No, no. Yeah, you're in the lead. You're in the lead by two. You're in the lead by one. No. I'm tied. You're in the lead by one. Tied. Yes. You're in the lead by one. <laughs> yes. You're in the lead by two. You're in the lead by one. You're in the lead by oh, tie. No. You're in the lead by one. You're in the lead by two. You're in the lead by three. Oh! Four. I don't know what this means anymore. I can't do the math. I think you just tied it up. You might have taken the lead with that. That's going to be a hard... Uh, we're going to have to count that shit. Oh, no. You're going away. Doesn't matter. Ready? Go. Yeah. 
It feels like you have a lot more cards we'll in your see. hand. We'll see. I have three left. I know. Well, I can I can throw these in my deck then. But that means you had a lot more to start. Wait, you had a nine. I had an eight. Oh, I had the nine. You had the eight. Yeah. All right. Rack them. Clap. Yeah, what does that mean? I have all these. Count them. Well, so count them. That's the, I, I ran out. I can't keep playing. That's how many you had left over from the game. Yeah. Two. Dude, your sound is throwing me off. <laughs> Holy shit, dude, I think it's a tie. <laughs> what do you got? How much you got? What do you got? <laughs> Wait, I have 26. I have 26. Oh, it's a tie, dude! <laughs> Because 26 or 26 equals 52! Oh, it's 52. Fuck. Good game! I finally, I've been wanting a tie, dude, yeah, on this cast. Great, that was a great tie. Good great cast. job. Good, good draw. Wow, I really thought you had me. I thought I did too. I'm happy that at your own pace, you came to the same conclusion that this was never going to end. <laughs> and then we found out a way to really end with a Well, the there was a moment there, Rob, where you were real low. Real oh, low. Oh, my God, I, I was I done. I was like, no, we're going to, the end, game's going to end. And then you won, and then you won, and then you won. It's okay, the game's not going to end. <laughs> oh, great game, folks. All right. Good job. Good job. Shall we get back at it? What, what's our time? What's our time frame, boss? We are an hour and six. Okay. Well, then you know what? Come back to it next time. Yeah, I think that, uh, I don't know about you. How do you feel about these definitions and reading it like that and learning together and like me reading I, definitions? I think, I think it's really smart. Um, does that flow well? Just like me reading and... It does. I think we could, we could probably summarize some things more. Um, before you, we get into it, but definitely like when, like, especially with these definitions, we probably could have just gone over that beforehand and summarized some stuff. So it didn't take up so much time, but it still was really good to learn in the moment. But then, uh, for the other things like, uh, Marlene, how do you say your last name? Marlene Winnell. Winnell. Um, and like learning about stuff like that, like in the moment, I think that's fun. Um, and the more stuff we want to learn about more specific topics, I think we could do in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, and we, I apologize for anyone uh, listening right now that uh, can be, you know, it's confusing to listen to me read a lot from the Wikipedia, but you can hop on and read this too. And I think that like, as I'm, we're going through this, what's exciting is like, we're learning a lot and the things that hit, I think we're like, re we're like connecting with that. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels good to put definitions and it feels like we're talking about a science, we're talking about a a psychology that's been studied and researched for decades, really. And so, um, yeah, I'm excited to keep going down. We'll keep doing that. So, um, yeah, love you, man. Love you, dude. And uh, hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving and happy holiday season. Coming up on Christmas in a few weeks here. I know. I know. I know. We're going to have a Christmas cast. Yes, we are. What are you going to be? The Grinch? <laughs> no. Oh. Anyways, all right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.